Good afternoon and welcome to the Veterans Forum. Today is the 4th of June, the year 2014. This program is coming to you from the Derry Community Access Television Studio here in Derry, New Hampshire. I'm Bob Stevens. I've had the honor and privilege of doing this show for about 12 years now. For those of you who do not know, this is being done in conjunction with the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project that was started back in the year 2000. The basic idea was to have any and all guys and gals who served anywhere in any capacity, if they can and will, share those experiences in a televised recorded interview so that the history that was made by the people who made it cannot be fiddled with and doctored or caught and forgotten. Today, like every other day, we have another guy who did his thing. I'll introduce him quickly, and then we'll get the show on the road. But before that, though, I can't see with my glasses on. I want to advertise the fact, I got this about two weeks ago now. This is a special telephone number, 211, that any veteran or any friend or family member who thinks he or she may need help in any capacity, dial that number and you'll be in contact with, you can't read it, but with this cadre of counselors and helpers to give you the help that you need and deserve. And remember this, ask for it. It's theirs to be had, but unless you ask, it will just seem to disappear. Okay, remember that number, 211. It's good throughout the state. Now, on to the program. I'm gonna ask Don to introduce himself, and then we'll take it from there. Young man, would you give us your full name, spell your last name for the record, tell us where you now live or temporarily live, your branch of service and the dates of service. My, my name is Don Williams, Donald Williams, and I live in Northwood, New Hampshire. And today's date is the 4th of uh, June. June. Okay, but I want the dates when you were in the service. Not oh. the, I know the day's date. I'm not I that was in the service uh, when I was drafted when I was 18 years old out of uh, Hillside, New Jersey. And I spent uh, uh, two and a half to three years. I, I was released from the Army in 1946. Uh, that's about two and a half years. Okay. And uh, what was your rank of discharge? I was a sergeant, a buck sergeant. Okay, three striper. Three stripes. And as a squad leader. Okay. And it was with the 290th Engineer Combat Battalion. We're trained in Camp Shelby, Mississippi. Okay, we'll get to that in a minute. But right now, we know who you are. But let's go back and build a history. Remember that old show like, uh, This Is Your Life? Oh, yeah. Well, I'd like you to give us your life. For example, you know, where and when were you born? Uh, how was your family life? Do you have any brothers and sisters, any members of your family in the service before, in school, in high school, college? It's your show. Well, I was born in Elizabeth, New Jersey, in a snowstorm. Um, I, in those days, in 1924, uh, the cars didn't have electric starters, so my father had to get out and crank the car up. Bing it to bing it and pull and the And he couldn't, couldn't get the car started. So my, my mother walk, walked six blocks to the uh, maternity home Wow. They gave birth to me. And, uh, uh, Did she walk? I have a sled or anything? She walked she oh, in the good. snow. <laughs> wow. But I have a brother who's, uh, who was four years older than I am. He's gone now. And uh, my father uh, at that time was uh, one of the pr uh, vice presidents of a singer company. The and sewing machine people? Yeah. Oh. He was in the division that made all the motors that went into the singer's sewing machines. And uh, I, uh, when I was old enough, I would start a public school in, uh, in Elizabeth. But then we moved to Hillside. That's the town I was uh, inducted from. And uh, I went to Pingree School as a prep school in, uh, in Elizabeth. All in New Jersey. Yeah, and I okay. went there for uh, 12 years until I Were well, you a good student? Any activities in the school did you remember that stand out or you wish the hell had never happened? Well, I was, <laughs> I was active in, uh, in athletics, uh, but I was never a large boy. I, I weighed about 130 pounds and I couldn't play football. I was too small for that. Did you do for the water boy? Well, 
I played tennis. Okay. And I also played baseball. And uh, I, I, I was on the varsity team, and I got one of the awards for baseball because I must have been able to throw pretty accurate. Good. But that was, oh, and I, was, I took uh, my college board's exams. Bef this was in 1930, uh, 39, 38, okay. I guess. And I was accepted to Cornell and Bucknell. And a after the war was over, I, my brother had been to Cornell, so I drove back to Ithaca with him to get ad admitted to Cornell. And they said, well, we'll take you in, but uh, it's a New York University. Uh, state university, so we have to give first preference to state, state residents. State guys, yeah. So we can't get you in for another year. And I've been accepted to Bucknell, so I went up to Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, and I said, well, when do you want to start? So I started my engineering career at Bucknell, and I fin finally graduated in four years with a BS in me mechanical engineering. Okay. Did then the Army come and get you? Then. Did uh, you go to work for a while? No, that was, I went into the Army when I graduated from, from Pingree. Oh, okay, you the jumped one heck of a big Well, that's years. the way I am. I <laughs> well, slow down or we're gonna get all screwed okay. up. Okay, you're up to through high school right now. Yeah, okay. yeah. and then I went in, was drafted and went into the, the service. Okay. And I was inducted into Fort Dix, New Jersey. Right. Question, I ask every guy. How was the first two or three days when you left being a civilian to becoming a GI type guy with all kinds of new things put upon you and asked of you. How did that, you handle that? That was tough because I was a wise guy too and I'd make some remarks to some of the old veterans who had been there for two or three months instead of two or three days. That and was a bad thing. That to was do. a bad thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask you what they are, but I, I, I can remember them. But, but how'd you feel? Did you feel lost or put upon or well, not knowing what to do? Not really, because it was a big, big world ahead of me, and uh, and I had an awful lot to learn, and uh, and I paid attention Good. to uh, what was told me, and I figured if, if I wanted to get any place in the Army uh, and come back, I should be able to do the things that I'm supposed to do, so I, I, I spent a lot of time uh, doing the right thing. Good. And I might, took my basic training, first basic training, and. Uh, camp in Fort Eustis, Virginia, <coughs> in uh, anti-aircraft. And then the ASTP, that's Army Specialized Training yeah. Program, that came through and I had, to, had the qualifications to be admitted into that, so uh, they sent me down to Queens College in Flushing, Long Island for a semester. But then the invasion, <coughs> excuse me, the invasion came along and they needed the troops. I think it was North Africa. Oh, Sicily and Salerno down that way. Yeah, and uh, they needed troops for the invasion, and they then they needed puncher, uh, p pencil punchers. Amen. So I was transferred then to uh, Camp Shelby, Mississippi, in the 69th Infantry Division, and I took a basic training, almost finished it in that, and then they were starting a new battalion of combat engineers, and they needed some cadre. Or some people that have been get some idea what's going right. on. Right. Yeah. So I was transferred into the 290th Engineer Combat Battalion for another basic training. They've but by this time, I I had two basic trainings, so I should have known how to. Ask about being in school. <laughs> well, I did know how to work an M1 rifle, and I used to take the 30 caliber machine gun out of the quartermaster's. Uh, position there and, and practice on uh, taking it apart and putting it together. So I got pretty good on that and uh, they had me instructing in 30 caliber how to field strip it and how to put it back together almost with my mind's with my eyes, eyes blinded. Blind. Yeah. Because some days you'd be in the dark and you have to do the same dang thing. That's right. So we went com completed the basic training at Camp Shelby and <clears throat> we went down to uh, Camp Shanks in New York for uh, shipping over to to Europe, okay, and uh, we were shipped to uh, to uh, England first. Do you any idea what when what by month and year you shipped out? Yes, uh, it was probably you know, probably forty four. 
But spring, summer, winter? Um, would have been in the fall, I guess. Okay. I'm just trying to get some dates. Yeah. You hop, and I want to make sure I'm hopping with you. But we were sent to England first uh, as engineers to learn how to put the English Bailey Bridge together, which is, goes together like an erector set. Mm -hmm. But the English Bailey Bridge is a, a little bit different than the American Bailey Bridge. And so when we got into action, we didn't want to get in there with two different, sizes. Two different <laughs> yeah. types of bridge. So oh. we took that basic training. How would you do? We went through it, and they, they graduated with us and sent us over to Europe, oh, that, <laughs> over to that France. You passed through no matter what else happened. Right. Uh, did you have instructors in British, uh, in English rather, or American guys? American guys. Okay, so that you could understand what they were talking about, right? Yeah. Yep. Ah. So we learned how to put both bridges together, and the reason for that was in action in, in France, uh, if uh, a job called for a Bailey Bridge to be uh, erected, mm -hmm. uh, and we only knew how to put the American Bra Bailey Bridge together, and the quartermaster shipped us English Bailey Bridge by mistake, we, we have to put it together. You know, basically it went together the same way, but the parts were a little different. Okay, they were probably metric and we were standard gauge or something like that. Something like that, probably. Okay. Anybody so, hurt in, in your training, in your practice? Yes, we lost one fellow, and as a matter of fact, I was standing, it was a uh, Ponton Bridge we were uh, erecting, and uh, I was standing next to him in the river, and it was a fast-flowing river, and uh, we were putting parts of the Ponton Bridge, cl clipping them together, and uh, he took one step and stepped in a pothole and went down in the, in the the w river took him going downstream so fast that I couldn't grab couldn't him. Even grab him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got downstream about 20 feet, and he went underwater. And <clears throat> we put a line of troops up uh, about a 50 feet or 100 feet downstream to see if we could catch, catch him you. coming down, but we missed him. Oh. And uh, he had caught up on a tree uh, stump that was underwater, and we didn't know that he had. Oh, he didn't even get as far as the line then? No. And you drowned it right there? Yep. Oh, God, what a way to go. Yep, and I was only 10 feet from him when he, 15 feet from him when he drowned. That was in training. Yeah, I, I know. But we went over and uh, landed in Le Havre uh, when we m went over from uh, England to the continent. We landed in on the troop ships. Now, was D-Day or sometime after No, it was D -Day. after D-Day. Okay, just want to get the time yeah. frame. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we took trains uh, up uh, towards the, where the action was in the front line area. That's where they could put us to work, fix, uh, putting bridges up mm -hmm. and uh, putting minefields. We weren't taking minefields down at that time, and we were putting them up because uh, okay. we were laying them. Were you a snapper? Um, Is the British call him a mine detector guy? Oh, he did that too, oh. yeah. Flip. But we had we did both. We we put mines when we needed them. Okay. And at that time, up near the line, the front line, the, the Germans were being pretty active, and uh, we were trying to protect our own positions. Mm -hmm. And then when we got going a little bit, had more success w with uh, moving forward, then we were starting to push the Germans' line back a little bit. Now, when you laid the minefield, did you or somebody have a grid so that you know where and when and how to step and where to mark it and so the guys in back of you didn't have to pussyfoot and hope that you didn't make it? Well, I, uh, I don't think we that, that that kind of a map, but we knew if we were going to mine a road, we knew uh, about how far ahead we should. We're not going to put mines two feet apart. No, oh, okay. Uh, and. Uh, in the daytime, you could see where we dug a hole and put it in, and then covered it over again. But if if the Germans were coming in our direction, uh, they probably wouldn't be moving in the daytime, and they wouldn't see the mines at night. Okay, so it kind of surprised them. Right. And did that happen very often? Well, it happened one bad time, and that's when I got hit with a mine. Oh, we'll get to that. We, all right. Well, that, that, it's part of the same story. Okay, it's just story. I'll shut up. We had uh, laid it. Uh, uh, Patton's uh, uh, tanks were moving forwards towards the Rhine, 
and uh, uh, we had laid mines down in this particular road that day. And at nighttime, uh, we pulled back to our positions, and uh, the Germans had a company of men, troops, that were hiding in the woods, and they came out of the woods at okay. night and put mines back in the same areas that we had demined that day before. And that night, I went out with a jeep driver uh, on a patrol to pr patrol over the same roads that we had just activated. We used to check them out. To check them out. Okay. And we <coughs> came to a uh, supply truck that was on fire. And uh, I stopped and told the, je driver, the jeep driver, just stay here, man. I'm going to go and check the, the truck out. Well, the truck was on fire, and, and the driver on the inside of the truck had been killed by the blast because the engine just came up right through the front of his Oh, was he still truck. in the truck? Still in the truck. Oh. So it had, and the truck was on fire, so it hadn't happened too long ago. Yeah. So I turned around and walked back to, towards the Jeep and said, turn around, we've got to get back out of here and, and report this right away because the road has been remined. The, the, uh, the Ger call. German troops had come out of the woods at nighttime and remined those roads. And the Jeep driver turned the wheel about 45 degrees and started to go forward to turn, and he went over another mine that was Whoops. we couldn't see at night. And it blew the Jeep up. And I was only about 10 feet in front of the Jeep when it blew it up, so it blew me over into a ditch, and it blew the windshield through the, the Jeep. And uh, and my driver was in pretty bad shape. All his face and everything? Yeah. But I got him out of the uh, Jeep, and we walked back to, uh, well, I... You got, got hit too, didn't you? I got Somehow. hit in the side, you okay. know, shrapnel in my side and my arm. But I could walk. I don't know how long I was unconscious by the road. I think I woke up pretty fast, because okay. it blew me into a ditch. But we walked back to uh, an intersection, and it was a Army uh, truck coming along, and he stopped and picked us up and took us back to an aid station, and I never saw my driver again. I don't know wh what I happened to him from that on, because he went in one direction and I went to another direction. And well, what happened to you? Where did you go? They took me the next day from that uh, field station to uh, the aid station to a field hospital, and that's where they operated on me and got the, the uh, shrapnel out of me. And then I was shipped back to France to a general hospital, and I spent about a month there. What, hour and hour? Versus yeah. the recap? Yeah. Okay. And then I was sent, but by this time, during that interval that I was back at the uh, uh, station, uh, the general hospital, uh, and I've, I've lost a, a little track of, di of time and everything in this, but it was while I was still back there that uh, VE Day was called, Roosevelt declared the truce. And, uh, Eventually, I was sent back to my own unit, and this was about a couple of weeks later. It took me a few weeks to get back to my own unit, and the but war they, was they over. They got you there, though. Yeah, but they got me there. But the war was over then. Uh, then we just went around from that point until I was uh, sent back to the States. Uh, we just uh, took uh, Bailey Bridges apart. Uh, and stacked them up, and they went back to quartermasters. And we replaced the one summer. We took the Bailey Bridge down, and it was a, a triple Bailey. That's, if you know, the uh, erective sets are put together where they put one set uh, of panels here, and then on top of it, another. that's a double Bailey. And then another one on top of that is a triple bailey, so it holds three times the weight, and then they can put the heaviest tank on Tanks that bridge. And trucks and stuff. Yeah. Well, we did, we uh, took that bailey down, and then we replaced it with a wooden trestle bridge. My whole company built Build on spot? Built on the same spot, and we worked on that the whole summer, and the German citizens used to sit on the riverbank and we were their entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> they, I don't think so. But they yeah. saw us putting the, uh, replacing the, the steel bridge with a wooden bridge, which was a uh, okay, good so job. Okay, so they were going to benefit in the end anyway. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. The bridge had to be replaced, and we were the ones that were doing it. Okay. 
but uh, from that point we went to uh, we we came we were sent back to the states on the number of points that we oh. had and you got like one or two points for every uh, month in combat and uh, so many points for every every day something else. Citation, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then I just went back to another camp and uh, stayed until it was my turn to come home. Now let's go back. That that's a pretty good span of time, but. There are two or three things that we've talked about here. I'd like you to walk us through some of your exploits before you got that far down the river. Where were you and how did things happen and what did you do about it? Well, uh, when we went under the continent on end of France, we moved up towards the, the line of action, which at that time was the Seventh Army. And uh, we, we were moved into a, a part of the action in Alsace-Lorraine. And, and that took place in the Vosges Mountains. And uh, the Seventh Army was uh, covering that particular area. And the troops, the, uh, the U.S. troops that were up in that area had been up there for a few months in the mountains. On and, the line and all that? Yeah, time. and this was wintertime now. Oh, God. And uh, so they were replacing uh, b battalions of uh, 28th Regiment, I think it was, but at any rate, I can't remember all of the numbers of the regiments. But we replaced a battalion of infantry that was up in, living in, in foxholes up in the no mountains. Time. They had been living up there as, as soon as their line had moved up that far, but it was in the wintertime and they couldn't really go much farther in the wintertime. So they were holding the position. And uh, my battalion, was sent up to replace a battalion of infantry. And they, we marched up the island, the, the uh, mountain, and walked over to a foxhole, and we got in, and the infantry guys got out, and we shook, shook hands, hands and, took off. and they walked down the mountain, <laughs> and we stayed. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that's how the, we replaced them. And and did you draw any uh, artillery, anything like that, any fights while you we were had, there? We had our own artillery. It was probably back a few thousand yards. Okay. But we didn't know what we were shooting at because we didn't have any observation posts up there. And the Germans had their artillery uh, in their territory a few thousand yards back, and they were firing us at us. But they probably had the area pretty well laid out and know just what they had, did because they sighted. they had already retreated from yeah. from that area a few months before, so they knew that area pretty well, their positions. But uh, uh, we were just holding positions, and we had, I, I lived in a, in a foxhole that had a machine gun in front of a 30 caliber. Oh, yeah, you were instantly trained, too. I was instantly trained. Lucky you. <laughs> I knew how to take it apart and yeah. put it together. Just. But uh, we got to a point where the 7th Army was planning to advance, and the winter was, was not still there, but it was, I mean, we had, the, maybe at 10, 12 inches of snow on the ground still, but it was getting into the months that it was gonna warm up, so uh, General uh, Patch, who commanded the 7th Army, says now we're gonna start getting ready to move forward now. So they sent patrols out from our lines into German territory to uh, get to uh, recon and to get information on other positions and the numbers of troops and Anything things. you could find. Anything that we could s visually yeah. see. And so I was sent out from my company area with a four-man patrol. Are you a squad leader by then? Any stripes? I had, yeah, I had two stripes now. Okay. But I was a squad leader. Okay. Because my squad leader, the, the sergeant, he had already, he'd left. <laughs> Okay. I, he got, at this point, it's so many years later, I forget just what his status was, but he wasn't there. Anyway, you were it I, was, I was the assistant squad leader, okay. so so uh, I took it over. And I took four-man squad, and it included myself, to get some uh, information, mm -hmm. uh, positions and all. And this to w the, the top of this mountain that we were on, or the halfway up, was... Uh, a, f a farm up there, it was farmland. And uh, so a few little houses scattered around from the farmers and then 
uh, you could go across the farm a few hundred yards, which was all flat. In the summertime, it had corn and things growing in it. But on the other side was woods, and there was a couple hundred yards of woods. And then on the other side of the woods, the, the ground sloped down to another valley. Well, the other, the, the German uh, guns, heavy guns, were on the other side down in the valley, but they were just shooting up over. Probably all like a mortar. Yeah. And we were getting hit with mortar shots, too. So I got over there to the other side of the farmland, and uh, there was a stone wall, just like we have here in New Hampshire, around the separate okay. farms the, and the all. The farmer's fence. Yeah. And I could see on top of the fence was a machine gun barrel because it was a machine gun nest on the other side of it mm -hmm. and two Germans down in there hiding just like we hide in the daytime. You're putting that map up here. You can kind of walk us through it. You will start it. You got just, you ready? Yeah. Uh, starting um, on the lower half, we get the, the, the roadway and then yeah. high, to the left, how you went up the hill around the stone wall. Okay, the, the one straight line on the bottom uh, is the 7th Army battle line. <clears throat> and then a couple of hundred yards across that open field which was covered with about 10, 12 inches of snow, was that was stone wall. Uh, the one right, right across the top. Yeah, and it sort of curves a little bit like an S. And uh, there was a machine gun nest. There's a little arrow down there on the left-hand side, about halfway up the, paper, the map. And there was a machine gun nest there. And then we took those two prisoners, sent them back, and then we started in through the woods, and I could see over on the right-hand side, still on the wall, another machine gun nest. So we went over there and we took those guys prisoners. And I sent each, there were two prisoners in each hole, and mm -hmm. I sent each one, each uh, two prisoners back with one of my patrolmen. He left you with two guys. So that, after we took them both, that only left me with two guys. Yeah. So we saw another machine gun nest a little bit farther up, and I said, Let's leave them there, because <laughs> okay. I'm not going to be sitting out here all by myself. So we took that one, and then I, I went up. Is there another hi higher side of the map that I could He's see? He's coming. He's going to show it. Oh, all there right. There's the top. I'm starting on the left-hand side. Yeah. OK. So uh, you, you can see down at the bottom, that's the wooded area. Yeah. And then up uh, farther. The next uh, line going up is at the bottom of the ridge. That's where the mountain slopes down yeah. into a ridge. And then farther up at the top is the beginning of where their heavy gun is yeah, that, uh, war. The, the thing on the left and the right that looks like yeah. a, a mushroom. Yeah, so that's gun emplacement. That's a, a thousand or a couple thousand yards back. And they were shooting over the mountain from those points. They had observation posts too. Yeah. And that's where their heavy guns were located. And down at the bottom of the, of the ridge there, I could see that there were uh, enemy uh, positions that were well, those en big, encampments. Those big circles right there, yeah. Yeah, encampments where they were, so they had their tents and so forth. Mm -hmm. And they were the two of those, and I estimated at the time there were maybe 100 men in each encampment. And and uh, they, they would spread out a little bit, and then that's where they were going and position themselves uh, to, at night when yep. they were camping. So that just about covers where their positions were. And then I, I took about a half an hour to draw this map. It wasn't this one map. This is the one I drew from memory. Okay. But I drew a more accurate one, accurate one then. And uh, then I took my sketch on a pad and I took everything back and turned it into my headquarters. Mm -hmm. And I did my part of it in that. And then about a week later, the Seventh Army started out. to move. And there were other positions all along the, the Army line there that were doing the same thing I was doing. They sent men out on patrol to get information oh, yeah. of enemy positions. The only I'm showing you is what we were responsible for. That's all you could do. Yeah. You, know, you, can't, you can't win the war alone. Yeah. Now, that, for that, you got a combination, I believe. Yes, I got the, uh, the Bronze Star the bronze for star. that. Bronze Star, okay. Because going over that field, they still had mortars that they were shooting, and then they weren't 
too accurate with them, but they were shooting mortars. mortars you can still rattle the heck out of you. Yeah. Now, it's up there on the screen, but I'm going to read it, if I may, All right. to make darn sure it is. Are we ready, folks? Here we go. Headquarters of the 21st Corps, Office of the Corps Commander, APO 101, U.S. Army, 2 June 1945. Subject, award of Bronze Star Medal. Two, Corporal Donald Williams, your serial number, Corps of Engineers, Company A, 20, 290th Marine Combat Battalion, United States Army. Correction. It's not Marine Combat Battalion, Engineer Combat Battalion. I beg your pardon. I, I have a prejudice. <laughs> <laughs> I stand corrected. Okay. <coughs> it says, by direction of the President and under provisions of Army regulations such and such, Donald Williams, Corporal, your serial number, Corps of Engineers, Company A, 290th Engineer Combat Battalion, United States Army, is awarded the Bronze Star Medal for meritorious service in connection with the 16 January 1945 through 5 February 1945 in France. Corporal Williams led a daylight patrol across extremely hazardous terrain covered with deep snow and captured two machine gun emplacements. Skillfully leading his patrol against methodical determination through subjugated, uh, subjected, excuse me, to harassing fire from enemy mortars. After penetrating the enemy defenses sufficiently deep to obtain accurate information, he returned with well-organized factual information and four prisoners of war. The results produced by Corporal Williams' action were of great value in higher ed headquarters and reflects good and great credit upon himself and the United States Army forces. Entered military service from Hillside, New Jersey, such and such. Signed, F.W. Wilburn, Major General U.S. Army Commanding. Congratulations, young man. Thank you. You did it. Thank you. Okay, now let's continue because there are more things. After that, where did you then go? Well, I, after, uh, I'm going to think, I have to think back Take a little bit. We, we went back to uh, the the duties of uh, engineers, which right, were after we leave the seventh. Yeah, I think, think we were still assigned to the seventh army, but we weren't to that division okay. or anything. We were a separate uh, individual. Well, you kind of an on-call outfit that if someone had a problem. If you were bridging a river or something, they'd get you rather than have their own group? Well, it wasn't that they had that problem, but we, we uh, aided in the river crossings. Okay. Uh, and we were attached to different divisions. Mm -hmm. that, that's what we were as combat engineers. We were attached to different divisions wherever they needed a, a, a okay. battalion of engineers to put a, a river crossing in. And if it was a, a pont and bridge, if, if, if heavy tanks were going over, we couldn't probably put a... A, a, a Bailey bridge. bridge. We'd put a bridge that was heavy enough to support the weight that was going to go over it. But we, we, as a matter of fact, not not my company, but one of the company B, had put a half of a Bailey bridge up. It goes together like an erector set, and uh, the Germans on the other side had started hitting mortar fire, and they blew the bridge down before they even got it halfway built up. That wasn't nice. And we lost a uh, good many men on that bridge. Uh, <coughs> my, my company didn't have that unfortunate experience of getting uh, shot at while we were building the bridge, but we had to get it up in a hurry. Amen, yeah, and get the heck under cover. Right, or we had to take one down and put it up someplace else. Now, as the war progressed and they kept advancing, did you have more and more bridges to construct because you're getting closer to Berlin or wherever you were heading? Yeah, Because we a did. lot of the little towns have rivers and valleys and yep. all that kind of good stuff. We had some bridges that had been um, hit with uh, mortar fire or, uh, or some kind of fire and had to be repaired. We would have to go into a bridge that was already assembled and take part of it down and, and replace it with, <coughs> with good, good, good sections. Parts, yeah. yeah. Like patch up an old car. That was harder to do than to build a thing from scratch, all the, from the ground up, to try to take all damaged pieces apart <coughs> yeah. and replace them. That was a difficult job, but we had to do that. It was all manpower. 
Now, this was yeah. all daylight stuff, too, wasn't it? Do you ever have to work at night sometimes? Yeah, we did. Under the cover of darkness. Yeah. Depend upon what it was and, and how close the enemy was. But we, in our training, we learned to assemble different bridges in, in the night. We had to do that. Okay. Learn to do it. So there were a lot of fellas that dropped a steel beam on their foot, and that's we they could have heavy shoes, but uh, yeah, but it still hurts. A lot then of you could cut your toes off. Sure. Yeah. And we had the same thing trying to put together some of these pontoons to making a causeway. You get the the hardware in the wrong distance, boy, you, it bites you quicker than you can get your fingers out of the way. Right. See, I was there two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> now, where were you when it was Thomas' time to go home? You've gone across. Where did you end up as far as your advancement into Germany or where you were going before you started coming back home? <clears throat> well, before we got into Germany too far, uh, the uh, Europe, European... VE Day. It was VE Day. Yeah. So at that point, we were just assigned as occupation in various towns. And uh, how, did, how did the, it be, it be interrupt you, but uh, how did the people in the town accept you, reject you, or did you hire them to work with and for you? How the hell? We were surprised that they really were happy to see us. They had had a war too long, the civilians. Mm -hmm. Military people might have had a different feeling about it, but the military people were all prisoners of war. And the civilians that lived in these little towns, they were really glad to see us come because they knew that it was all over mm -hmm. and their loved ones are s still alive, the ones that were alive, and they weren't going to be sure. killed in action, right? And they, the uh, civilians cooperated with us wherever they could. Now, and one I had sometimes to work with you, or to just give no, them we, a we job didn't, we and didn't pay them in food stuff. We didn't uh, ask them to help us build anything because that wasn't their job. Okay. <clears throat> but uh, as one example, um, one bridge that we built uh, during the summer of uh, '45, I guess, or six in that J June, July area, uh, we needed wood to build this bridge. And there were lumber yards in the vicinity. And one of my jobs was to go and inspect the, the lumber yards and, and produce the, the wood that he needed to build the bridge, like if it needed a six by six. So you start or, with the whole log and you had it mill it? They had steel, they had uh, uh, lumber mills. Okay. Where they, that even when they weren't at war, that they were built in uh, yeah. houses. So I would, I would go uh, take a jeep driver, and we'd go to a particular mill that had a lot of trees and everything. They were sawn up, and I'd give them an order for so many four by fours and so many uh, two by eights that we needed to build this. Oh, bridge. Was that metric size or, or American size? Here? American size. Okay. You get they had to be able to calculate them. themselves, but oh, yeah. <laughs> but they gave us all kinds of cooperation. Good. And I would go in there, and the, the commander, the fellow that was running that mill, would come to me and shake hands and says, oh, "Well, what do you need today?" And we'll put it. I'll change the, the uh, schedule, and we'll do that for you now because you need that now. Good. So I, I have to say, we did get good cooperation from the German citizens. How about the towns? Were they cleaned up as, as they went along so that there was a lot of damage? But I've been told by a lot of guys <coughs> that as soon as they get through the barrage, they'd be out there cleaning the sidewalks, wiping the streets, and they keeping were. them crystal they, clean. They cleaned things up. They knew that we were making just as much mess as their own troops were. And the, the different uh, uh, factories along the way where we needed uh, uh, flour for our own cooks to make to, to process and, and make food for us. We could go to the flour mill and and tell them what we needed, and they would get it out for us. And uh, I didn't get involved with paying for it, but because that was another department in the army. But but th they would provide what we needed. Now, did you ever befriend any of these people? You're going to be there for a couple, three weeks, or a month, so that you got to know them a little, or they got to a accept bit. you? Yeah. Did you ever have to just happen to have an extra pound of coffee or some cookie bars or something? 
No. Leave it on the table. No, because we couldn't get, we couldn't steal it out of our own uh, you know, kitchens, you know. <laughs> you repositioned it. Come on. <laughs> no, I don't recall uh, uh, okay. doing anything I'm like that. I'm just being nosy, that's all. Yeah. Now, any, any time that it, you were at rest, did you have to have a chance to go out and do some exploring or, or visiting? Or, or yes, because uh, we got vacations, the troops got vacations and passes and uh, furloughs. For where? In Europe. I went to Switzerland for a whole week. Go any skiing? No, I didn't, but I went up Jungfrau, which is a, a mountain on the other side of uh, Interlaken, uh, Lake, uh, I kept the name of the lake. Anyhow, this is a mountain I went up in a, in a. Uh, Did you uh, walk it or climb it or oh ride no, it? Oh no, I went up in a ride in an elevator, up in the top elevator. of it, and we could had an observation post up there where we could look across to another peak that was a half a mile away, and you could see uh, bodies that were up there that had, on climbers that had died up there, and the wind was just blowing their clothing around. But this was just a month, month, couple of months after the war was over that we could uh, do that. Okay, now changing gears a little bit. Now that you're all over and done with you coming home, how was your reception when you got home? Well, did you get back to I trip? came into uh, Staten Island. How would you come back on a boat or a fly? No, no, we can't. No, we Queen came Mary, back. everybody had a private stateroom and air conditioning. I went over on the. Um, on a, uh, an Italian troop ship, an Italian used to be a liner, and used to take troops over there, and then would come back with wounded, mm -hmm. yeah. like a hospital ship coming back. That's what I went overseas on. Coming back, I just came back on what was a, a, a passenger liner, and we we docked. Stay rooms or just they go birthing and hold big spaces? No, no, they're trying to get a lot of troops back at one time and over, so they had hammocks hanging up mm -hmm. in the, some of the they storage rooms. They to get into, aren't they, when they swing out from under you? <laughs> well, we didn't mind too much. I know, they're going home. <laughs> How was the chow on the way home? Any better than going over? No, no. Same hot water and ice apples and... Well, uh, you know, a, a GI after a while will eat anything that's, it won't bite that's not moving. <laughs> <laughs> oh, crap it if it is. And when you landed there, what kind of reception did you get? Bands playing or did you well, just kind of walk in? And my, father, my father knew pretty, uh, some people in the, uh, uh, not the Army, but uh, where he could get information on which troops were coming in. And Transportation what. Corps. Yeah, I guess that was it. So when I got off the boat in Staten Island, I could hear somebody yelling at me. And it was my father and my brother that saw me get off the boat, and they were yelling at me, and I saw them as I was climbing down the gangplank, and I could go over, and they were the first people that I saw. Did you feel good, didn't you? Yeah. Of course, if I wasn't living that close to Staten Island, I, they wouldn't have, if I had been living out in California, I couldn't have gotten any, but, but... But you did it, that's the important thing. But he also knew <coughs> where, when I got wounded and how bad I was, because uh, he knew the same person in the American Red Cross, I guess, that he was able to get this information. Okay. And uh, so he found out how I was before the government sent home a notice that's about that I was wounded. Oh, good. Hey, <laughs> so you were well protected. Then. Yes, I was. Now, when you get also doing your homecoming and unwinding, did you join anything like the VFW, the American Legion, DAV? I didn't. Uh, I could have, but I just had had enough. Uh, okay, good answer. Of that at that point. At that point, now I the, wanted to get in the college and get. Okay, that's the next question I was going to yeah. ask you. Thank you, GI Bill. Did you use it, and did it help you any? I used the whole bill. Four years of college and engineering. Co school. Uh, I went to Bucknell University okay. in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, and I took four years of uh, mechanical engineering. And I, did, I graduated with a degree in BS in mechanical engineering, and I didn't have to pay for one cent of it. Okay. They paid for every morsel I ate. 
they didn't drink for a couple of beers I might have had along the way. Oh, but no. <laughs> Frat I never could understand enemy. that. But <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We all did it. <laughs> but all my, my slide rule, that we, in those days we didn't have any computers. I know, a triple log log slide. So we did everything on, cal yeah. on the, uh, plus slide the rules. Yeah. But they bought all my books, any instruments I needed. I, I just, I can't believe how well I was okay. treated. And it's the best thing that could have happened. Yep. Like that song says, it saves us a, guy, a wreck like me. And a, if, if that hadn't happened, we'd still in a mess, I think. Now, yeah. when did you go to work? When did you get married and have a family and all that good stuff? How well, my, my wife had graduated from another college, from Skidmore, uh, th three years before I, no, she, she graduated in 1949 because she's a little bit younger than I. And, uh, and I didn't graduate until 1950. So when she graduated from school, we got married right away in, in August. And we started, uh, I started my senior year at Bucknell. Uh, and she came, she had already graduated from another college. And uh, we had a little apartment in Lewisburg and that's where we started. She Were you was, working at the? I was going to college as okay, a. Okay, but I mean, when you get finally get. Right. Yeah, when I got out. Yeah. Yeah, I got a job right away. Where? I got it for Ryerson Steel, which is a division of U.S. Mm -hmm. of uh, uh, Inland Steel. Inland Steel, yeah. It's the Steel Service Center division. Mm -hmm. And Betty's first year of <coughs> work after she graduated from college with a degree in uh, uh, art education. She taught school in Lewisburg, and there were two grammar schools in Lewisburg, and they didn't have an art department in any one of them. The, the homeroom, te homeroom teacher used to take the kids and give them art. Crazy. <laughs> that she said, now we're gonna draw a house, children, to get your pencil and pad, and then she'd go up to the blackboard, and this is a house, you know, and That's the roof, roof. And, yeah. and all the kids had to do that. Well, Betty got in there with all the new ideas how to teach. And she says, no, we're not going to do it that way. <laughs> so, but they didn't have an art room in, in any of the schools. So we went to the janitor, said, don't you have a room down here we can use as a... Can I clean it out? Yeah. He says, yeah, I can change them from that room to this. And he said, I can make a room for you. So Betty and I went down there on a weekend and we painted it. She and I did. We painted the room and made an art room out of it. And we stole a chair from this room and a table from that room. You and this. Oh, boy. Well, you sound yeah. like a crook. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, I'm sorry. But we started uh, the art department in two grammar schools, and some of the teachers still wouldn't let their kids come down to the art room. Oh. And then there's a, uh, the uh, director of art for the whole state of Pennsylvania used to make annual trips throughout the whole state and stop at every public school see how our program was going in that school when he came to Lewisburg and they said well we don't have an art department here we're just starting one up and he went down and talked to Betty because she was the art she department was it, yeah. and she said you know the, the teachers won't let some of the kids come down here he says I'll fix that so he went around and he gave everybody the orders that we're gonna have an art department here and this is what you're gonna do so that really started the art program in the Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. Right. That was her first job. And then from there, we she p taught for almost 30 years. Wow. And uh, she's an exceptionally fine artist. And she was painting for the uh, Coast Guard, uh, Coast Guard in action. Mm -hmm. And she would go into uh, a Coast Guard station like in Chatham on Cape Cod or Another one, there's one in Naples, Florida, that she just stop in and, and they would take photographs of uh, some, some of some. the things that they did. <clears throat> and then she would go in and they'd give her the photograph and she would make an oil painting of it or a watercolor, whatever they wanted. And she did that. She has commendation from the Admiral of the Coast Guard for for three different years that oh, she great. did this for, and her work is down in Washington now. Wonderful. Now, yeah. do you guys said have a family? We started right away. That's not the answer to the question. Did you have one? Oh, we did. We had 
Two boys, boys and a girl. Good. How are they doing? Fine. The, the uh, boys are, one of the boys teaches at University of New Hampshire, and the other boy did taught, taught in a private uh, school for three years, and then the school folded up because oh. they weren't, well, it was, they were getting, sub, uh, getting uh, help from the state of Connecticut at the time, and Connecticut pulled their, uh, pulled their the money back. The money back. Yeah. They were, so they did close that school down. But he went to work for the, who used to be the superintendent of that school, uh, who owned a store of uh, a lot of houses, I think about 10 or 12 houses, that would hold, oh, six to 10 people in them. And they like were all- dormitory? Yeah, they were all uh, adults. Oh. And they had been assigned, they had been put there by the state of Connecticut because they, they woods people, you know, they didn't have a place to live, mm -hmm. but they didn't have any occupation either. So the, the second, the oldest son would go in there and work in these houses and handle all the maintenance in them, but while he was putting a new toilet in or fixing the roof or doing whatever, he'd get the residents, the men in that house that were living there, to help them on the job. So they learned how to do this. A little training, OJT. And that same fellow now owns T over 20 houses now in the state of Connecticut Good. that he has filled up with uh, homeless people. Mm -hmm. And my son is really 62 years old now, and he's almost ready for retirement himself. Take but a room in one of his houses. He still goes in there and he and he has to fix something, uh, no, uh, no matter what it is in the house, whether it's electrics or roof or. Well, he's the guy. And he works with these guys that live in the house so that the next time that. The, the toilet gets clogged up, they know how to fix it. Yeah, and how know? about your daughter? What does she do? She works for a company in uh, Maine now, and it's, uh, they sell, they buy and sell tools, uh, power tools and hand tools. Oh, is that that Chinese outfit, the harbor machinery that you see advertised in the back of no, the No, probably not that. I don't know how they compare in size to that, but okay. this is in, in uh, Liberty, Maine. And the owner of it travels around all during the week, and he buys uh, job lots, odd lots, wherever the, the somebody is selling. Yeah, whether okay, it's a, a drill press or something uh, mechanical or, or hand tools, and they resell it, and it's very successful. And he yeah, and she's the manager of it now, and good. she hey. she runs it, well. and they do they do a very nice yeah. job. People come from all over Maine now and to you look for there? Yeah, Wonderful. they do. And the other and the other boy teaches at the University of New Hampshire. Now, one question, if you will, kind of wrapping this up, it's about time to pull the plug, I guess. Uh, with all the stuff you've seen and done and so forth, has your military experience been positive or negative as far as how you feel it affected your life? I, th I think it's... I, I'm going to say it's a, it's a positive, because everybody has to learn something as you go, get older in life, you always are exposed to new things, and you, you have to keep learning all your life, you know, you can't just say, I'm, stop see. learning now, mm -hmm. and I, you die. yeah, and I've always felt that I go from one phase of my life into another, and it's, it's some, a new thing that I'm learning to do, or, the end is the beginning of something new, it is. Okay. And the, ex the military experience was something new at the time. And I'm, I'm sorry that we had to go through a war to give me the experience, but I can't regret the fact that I did have that experience and I learned something yeah. of myself. Good use. I learned something of myself, yeah. whether I was capable of accepting certain orders mm -hmm. or whether I wasn't. Here we go. And, uh, that's sort of the outlook I have on life. Two words. Thank you, buddy. Oh, thank you for, for asking me. For your service. It's been a lot of talk. Thank you for thank asking you. me. Okay. That's a wrap, folks. But before I go again, I want to remind you of this one thing. 211. It could be a lot of help to a lot of guys. All you have to do is dial 211, and you'll be well taken care of. For those of you 
who are seeing the show, hopefully some of you will be, shall we say, convinced that you too could like to share your information. Please don't be bashful. This is your show. I'll do all I can to make sure you have a good time. But the important thing is, we're fighting the clock and the calendar. And the longer you postpone it, someday you may not be able to make a change. So while you can, and if you will, please come and tell us. Because if you don't tell your story, nobody else will. And that's lost forever. It's too much of an expense to lose, please. Again, Bob Stevens saying thank you. Come and see us. Stay healthy. <laughs>